Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Watchmaking ABC, where I want to explain to you all the basic terms and principles of mechanical wristwatches. My name is Matthias Kieser and I'm an independent watchmaker from Germany. Today we're going to talk about automatic winding. We're going to take a brief look at the history behind the invention, look at the different types there are and cover some very interesting facts that you can impress your watch collector friends with at the next meetup. watch where the energy for powering the gear train is stored needs to be wound. In a manual watch this is done by turning the crown. Here we have an example of a manual watch movement which is used in both pocket and wrist watches. Under this wheel, which is called the ratchet wheel, sits the barrel. In the barrel the main spring is coiled up. The ratchet wheel is connected to the winding mechanism and if you turn the crown the main spring is loaded. If you forget to rewind the watch from time to time it will stop. Watchmakers tried to take on the problem very early on when there were only pocket watches around. The problem was that the winding crown hadn't been a thing yet with the first pocket watches and in order to wind your watch you had to use a key and such a small key could easily get lost. Furthermore, you had to have a hole in the case of the watch which caused dust to enter into the movement. Therefore, Abraham Louis Perillet, a Swiss watchmaker, invented the first self-winding pocket watch in the 1770s. He used to be an apprentice at the workshop of famous watchmaker Breguet. The construction of that watch was astonishingly close to what an automatic watch looks like today. A centrally mounted rotor was transferring energy to the mainspring via a set of gears. And it was working in both directions. He called his invention the perpetual, a term which makes watch enthusiasts think of Rolex immediately. However, the mechanism proved not to be as effective as Perillet had hoped, because a pocket watch was sitting in the pocket of its owner rather statically. It was Breguet who adapted Perillet's concept and used an oscillating weight that was functioning more like a pendulum to make it more useful for the application in a pocket watch. Despite the proof of concept, automatic pocket watches didn't get a lot of attention. They were rather costly and too unreliable so that they'd be forgotten at the beginning of the 19th century. The invention of the winding crown in the middle of the 19th century was the nail in the coffin for the automatic pocket watch anyways. In the 1920s, wristwatches became increasingly popular and the fact that they are worn on a part of the body that makes a lot of movement brought the concept back into the discussion. Léon Leroy from Paris started to build wristwatches with a pendulum weight, but the big breakthrough didn't really happen. The watches were mostly women's watches and a few unique pieces for the collector Sir David Salomons. Another name worth mentioning in the early efforts to make automatic wristwatches is John Harwood. He developed an automatic caliber which was produced by the famous Adolf Schild SR, sold by Fortis and Blancpain. But frankly, the movement wasn't particularly good. It had too many screws and a tiny power reserve of only 12 hours. When the global economic crisis struck, the whole project was scrapped in 1931. In the same year, another very renowned figure in the industry was also experimenting with the automatic mechanism. Hans Wilsdorf, founder of Rolex and his head of engineering, Emil Bora, wanted to introduce an automatic watch. It wasn't by chance that they put the automatic caliber in their waterproof oyster watches first. They simply wanted the crown to be used less often, as it was a weak spot for leakages. No winding meant no opening of the watch, no possibilities of incorrect operation, and thus more reliable water resistance. About 160 years after initially being invented by Perillet, the automatic watch had finally established itself in the watch world. Here we have an automatic wristwatch movement, which has an automatic mechanism. Commonly used today is a semicircular weight, which can rotate 360 degrees and wind up the mainspring either in one or both directions. This is the rotor, which can move freely around the central axis of the movement. It is equipped with a ball bearing to minimize friction 
and ensure long service life. A sprocket is attached to the bottom of the rotor, which engages with these two reversing wheels. A ratchet mechanism inside the reversing wheels ensures that the two-sided rotation of the rotor is only transmitted in one direction. This is why this is a bi-directional winding rotor. On the other side of the bridge, the rotation is then translated from fast to slow. The rotation of the small rotor generates less force per revolution than can be applied by hand via the crown, of course. The rotor must therefore turn more often to provide the same amount of energy. This happens via these gears. The last gear engages with the ratchet wheel, which sits on the mainspring barrel. A slipping clutch prevents the spring being wound too far, causing permanent damage. But the history of the automatic wristwatch is rich in a wide variety of alternative inventions and developments. Manufacturers who wanted to build automatic watches but couldn't infringe existing patents had to be rather creative. One example is Pierce's automatic mechanism with a linear oscillating rate. A similar design is used in the Tarkoya V4 or the Hublot MP10. So not everything that's sold as brand new development is actually that innovative. Another interesting example is the hammer automatic that I can show you here. The weight doesn't turn a full 360 degrees, but rather oscillates between two springs which dampen the impact. This caliber is from an old s watch. Another example for this design is the Alpina 584. One of the disadvantages of the automatic mechanism is that it adds height to the caliber, as you need a rotor and a set of gears. One solution for that was the invention of the micro rotor. The rotor no longer sits on top of the movement, but is integrated into the plane of the movement. Universal was certain to be the inventor of the concept and patented it in 1957. However, Buren Watch Company were a little quicker and had filed for their patent 11 months earlier. End of story. Universal had to pay four Swiss francs to Buren for every movement they made. The thinnest automatic watch and the thinnest automatic tourbillon at the same time is the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Tourbillon Automatic released in 2018 with only 3.95 millimeters. In this watch, Bulgari set two new records for both the thinnest automatic watch and the thinnest tourbillon watch. The movement BBL 2A8 in this watch is only 1.95 millimeters thin. To sum it all up, the automatic winding mechanism is super interesting from both a technical and historical point of view. For you as the wearer, it gives you the convenience of not having to wind up your watch regularly. But not only that, as the spring of an automatic watch is constantly wound, the force it generates is more constant, resulting in better timekeeping capabilities. Fun fact, the winding mechanism of an automatic watch would even work in zero gravity. If you turn the watch around the horizontal axis, the weight would remain at the current position due to inertia. That would create torque and thus wind up the watch. I hope you enjoyed learning more about watchmaking today. Don't hesitate to leave us any question or other interesting facts you may know about the automatic winding mechanism in the comment section below. In the next video, we'll be covering the letter B, like balance, the heart of the watch. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on anything. See you in the next one.